Hello, everybody. I'm Mark Fisher, and welcome to our channel, Our Scientology Stories, Peeling the Onion. And we've got a very special interview that we're going to be doing today. But first, let me introduce you, uh, my co-host, Janice Gillum Grady. Hi, Janice. How are you? I'm good. Good day, everybody. Hope you're all well. <laughs> and uh, we're we're ready to roll. We've got a good one for you today. Absolutely. And and I'm just going to remind you before we start, please subscribe to our channel. Uh, it helps us get out more videos and, you know, that type of thing. You guys all know. Click the like button. Click the subscribe button. Anyway, no, um, without... Slam it, Mark. Slam you it. Slam okay, it. slam it. <laughs> all right. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce our guest. Okay. Uh, his name is Mitch Brisker, and uh, he's a longtime Scientologist. Mm -hmm. And uh, he ha he was a professional director and still is a professional director in Hollywood. And then eventually he was hired uh, by Scientology, the Golden Air Productions in 1990, to come up and to be a professional director for the technical films and administrative films. And, and he was the director for many, many, many years until recently. So we're really pleased. This is just a general outline of his uh, story of who he is. But uh, we're going to go into more detail. And uh, Janice, why don't you go ahead and introduce Mitch? Hi, Mitch. Yeah. How you doing? Hey, guys. Hi, Mitch. Good to see you. Good to be here. <laughs> it's been a long time. Yeah. I was 19 years old when we first met. Yeah. I, you know, I had no recollection of that, quite honestly, uh, until you reminded me. And I was like, oh, my God, because, you know, that was I just gotten out of film school. Uh, maybe uh, I think it was 1975, right? And yeah, I was yeah. working for a production company in Hollywood that I was doing commercials and special effects and things. And your mom, yeah. who I was close with, who pretty much saved my life and helped me get off drugs and back into film school and, and on, on a career path, uh, she had arranged, as you reminded me, I was like, oh, my God, she'd arranged. You, you had a layover on a mission, as I remember. And she arranged you had nothing to do and obviously she was busy running celebrity center so she arranged for you to come to my office so we just could hang out so that, that's right and i just here's, here's a that, picture of her right here yeah and i just oh, yeah. spent that day hanging out with you watching you do your film work yeah i mean i see that picture and i'm just filled with i don't know emotion because she was such an amazing person uh anyway it's just you know i often say that or I have said that <clears throat> mean dog owners have mean dogs. Nice dog owners have nice dogs. Yeah. Scientology right now is being led by a mean dog. And there's a lot of, I mean, a mean leader and there's a lot of mean dogs. But Yvonne was an example of how a space can be when the person is, is really caring. Um, I mean, I don't want to promote that like, oh, Scientology took a wrong turn and it needs to go back into that direction because the outcome is ultimately going to be the same. But what happened during a magical time when she established and then ran Celebrity Center was really amazing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, she was what people believed a true Scientologist was supposed to be. Yeah, plus if I could just interject in those days, you know, us boomers, we were going to change the world. The word, the word counterculture really meant something. I mean, we all grew up in the shadow of nuclear, uh, the threat of nuclear war with the Soviet Union. Yeah. We, I'm, my, I'm sorry, my picture is glitching. I have something going on with my USB connection. That's okay. Just keep going. <laughs> yeah, sorry, but I'm going to get that fixed for our, 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 our next interview. Anyway, so, you know, we remember Kennedy being assassinated and, JF, and RFK and, and, and Martin Luther King and all that. And we were experimenting with uh, Eastern religion and drugs and and we weren't going to, we were going to change the world. I mean, more so than any generation has since. And Scientology emerged, at least in my view, it was, a, it had the potential of a counterculture movement. It, it's something you could participate in that was positive and was going to change the world. Of course, we right. all know that it didn't work that way. And there were other movements. I mean, you know, but for me, I needed help with drugs and they were extremely welcoming. I mean, the the Scientology that I experienced at that time at Celebrity Center was unrecognizable to what Scientology. Yep, there it is. Yeah, the old, uh, the original CC. <laughs> yeah. Where was, that, where was that, Janice? That was on 8th Street in downtown Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah 8th near Alvarado. It's just a little west of... 
it's in an area kind of I guess, I think guess today it's called Koreatown, but back then it's it's sort of this place. It's the corridor that from downtown Los Angeles proper. There's this kind of corridor moving west, and Celebrity Center was in it. Yeah, that was what an old supermarket originally, I believe. I don't know. I've heard supermarket. I've also heard furniture store. So right. I've, both because I don't actually know all I know all I mean the main thing I remember was the catering truck that used to park in that parking lot <laughs> and, and you, was that like a lunch truck <laughs> yeah like a lunch truck yeah I should catering truck yeah, yeah. A, a roach coach yeah right would and then inside <clears throat> in the main course room which was quite a big space the floor was covered with carpet remnants yeah. Like, do you remember that? <laughs> like all different patchwork of carpets. It, I mean, it looked like it had been decorated from a flea market by a bunch of hippies. I mean, well, it, it was. was back then. Celebrity Center was like a hippie commune without uh -huh. the sex and drugs. Right. They had, had the poetry by candlelight. Yeah, it was great. I mean, you yeah. never knew what you were going to get. You could get chicory one night. You could get. There was that the the what were they called? I forget. But there was a, the acting group with Jeffrey Lewis and Karen Black and uh, s some other people, actors. Are you they talking about was, Celestial Navigations? No, no, no. That was an, a band. That was later, later, right? Yeah. That was later. Yeah, but there was an improv group. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and they yeah there was an improv group with the headlined with Karen and Jeffrey, uh, and. Um, yeah, it was. You never knew what you were going to get, and there wasn't. Uh, I'm, as you reminded me when we corresponded, Janice, that there, there was a, a VIP component to Celebrity Center. It wasn't the one like they have today. It wasn't right. like, you know, if there's a celebrity in the house, don't make eye contact. Like if they look at you and talk to you, I mean, this is what I observed. It's not what happened to me, but it's a very different scene than back then when when they were there. They were just part of the group oh yeah, yeah. You know. oh yeah well mark yeah, go so. back to that photograph okay because because it's that parking lot where i met john travolta and his mom and dad the first time they were just standing <laughs> there in the parking lot and mom and i came out and talked wow with them. that's wow. amazing i didn't think john i thought john got yeah I, I don't remember him there i remember him well that doesn't mean anything there's a lot of things i don't remember uh but i remember him really well from the celebrity center moved from 8th Street to La Brea, right. and then moved yeah. moved into the chateau where it yeah, is no, today. Yeah, no, he was filming Welcome Back, Carter. Oh, my God, then it would have been that era. You're right. Yes, yes. Yeah. And if you look at the second story there on the left, the windows that are closed with the right? white, that was Mom's office. Oh, wow. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, so that's where I and that's where I got to know Heber, uh, Gench, who was just an amazing individual. I mean, great guy. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. He was a great guy. Yeah, unfortunately, his outcome was rather tragic. I saw him, and I think the last time I saw Heber was in uh, 2018, right? Like oh, not that long ago. That maybe 2018. Yeah, five yeah. Years ago? yeah. Wow. He was. Uh, I've heard that he's been taken to a nursing home. He was kind of broken when I saw him. He was in the care of the medical liaison office, uh, which you can say what that is, whatever. But the CERG members are very restricted to healthcare. They have to go through very specific procedures to receive healthcare. So he was in the one of the people from the MLO's office, and they're very they're nice people, can be. They were helping him. And uh, I passed him in a hallway and he looked at me. I mean, he he had a walker and he was hunched over, but he looked at me and said hi, and the sparkle in his eyes was not changed one eye Right. From so he I recognized you. Oh, we, I knew him well. I mean, because yeah. I knew him from CC, and then, uh, you know, I would see him always at events and so forth before I worked for the church, uh, and we would always say hi. And then when I went to work for Gold, I mean, I shot him in properties. You know, I was at the HGB one day, working on the first iteration of the orientation film. And I get a call on my cell phone from Miscavige. And he says, Heber's on the 12th floor. I need you to go up there and shoot him for a video I need in court. And I'll pay you $3,000. And 
So I'm like, I'm like, I'm already being paid. I mean, I didn't say that, but you know, I'm going to take the money. But I'm like, you didn't right. need to do that. I'm already being paid. Uh, and I, I had a crew there, so I went up to the 12th floor and I did this shot, this interview with with Heber. So yeah, I knew Heber really well. Uh, now I had heard Heber. Well, he was very hunched over, and when they did some videos of him, they had to prop him up. Yeah, well, I didn't. I didn't do those videos. I don't know. I never saw that. Oh, okay. I mean, he's eighty years old. He's he's some eighty year olds are in great shape. He's not yeah. particularly in great shape. He was. I mean, but I mean, the nice thing is, is that the way he looked at me, and and just he still had that thing, right. that sparkle in his eyes, yeah. and that warm way of greeting you. So it's like. But I don't know what's happening to him now, but he's, I, I heard he's in a nursing home. But Yeah, well, he'd be about 88 years old now. 88, wow. yeah. Well, he yeah. was, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. But I definitely remember he and your mom, when you know, oh. they were sort of running CC. Right, yeah. And then and were you starting your career in Hollywood then, too, when you were a celebrity? I didn't really have a career in Hollywood. I had a t career in, in TV commercials, so I mm -hmm. consider that more advertising than Hollywood. But okay. I worked in Hollywood because that's where our production company was. And I basically what happened was the, the staff at CC helped me get off of drugs. Uh, I actually lived with the staff for uh, six weeks, which is unheard of. I mean, I'm probably the only person that that ever happened to where they were. And I, we can talk another time about that whole period, the yeah. period where I lived with them. But I mean, I'll give you example, one example of how different it was from anybody else's experience. Uh, the person who sort of took me in was uh, the medical liaison officer because I was having a physical problem and I was addicted to drugs. And she said, look, if you do this, you can, we can help you get off of drugs, but you have to do it. You have to apply yourself. And if you do that, you can do this. And when you do that, we can talk about if you want to continue doing Scientology. Who the hell says that today in Scientology? Right. Six weeks later, I was gained weight. I was healthy. I was sleeping. And she said, what do you want to do? Uh, there was no pressure, nothing. Uh, and I said, I think I want to do some auditing because, you know, this is, I've, this has been great for me. So naturally I stayed, but there was zero pressure uh, right. to do that. And so then I, entered, I went back to college. I got my degree from California Institute of the Arts. And then I uh, got a job with a very good company, which is where I met you when you came to visit me. And then did a lot of commercials and some music videos and some other things. Uh, worked on a couple of features, one when I was in college. Um, actually, both during the time I was in college. And then around 1990, no, in the 80s, mid 80s, they were looking for someone to do Dianetics commercials and to keep Jeff Hawkins' campaign going. They needed a commercial director. And they heard about this guy who was public at CC, who was a commercial director. And they, a woman approached me, an executive from the church, and I started working with Jeff. And, you know, we, in, we did those ads like, I mean, Jeff had this brilliant grasp of the situation. And basically his strategy and his ideas with some creative help from a couple of people he brought in, me and another guy who had been a creative director at a major, like Shia Day or some major uh -huh. advertising agency. We sold 10 million books in three years, so it was a big deal. Of yeah, course, was, you know, were, then, these, were uh, these those question ads? Yeah, well, they the were. Yeah, out? and others, but most notably, they were the questions ads, which I uh -huh. I've made all produced all those ads, which is nothing. You know, it's you phone it into a, a a video house um, because you know it's just text on screen, but they were incredibly effective. It was probably yeah. the most oh, effective. That was part of the whole boom we went through throughout yeah. the whole 80s. Yeah. We were doing fantastic. Yeah. And so, you know, David Miscavige caught wind of it and he was like, what is happening here? How come there's all this success happening outside my purview? <laughs> so, <laughs> like, he couldn't handle that. And no. so, he also had no one to making films. And how's this guy in... You know, marketing was in L.A. at that time. They were in the, right. that beautifully painted blue building, you know, which was just like couldn't have picked a better color. Right. <laughs> and uh, so you can't uh, miss it. No. Uh, yeah, you can't. So uh, they were located in that building and that's where I met Jeff. And that's where we did the work out of. Uh, 
And then, so there was also the other issue of they couldn't get films done. Like I didn't know this, but uh, you probably know this because you guys yeah. were there, especially you, Mark, because you were working yes. in Miss Cabbage's mm -hmm. office. But the shoot crew, as they are called, the film crew, right, had been banished to the galley, the kitchen, and they were not allowed to touch their equipment, and they were they were washing dishes and you know whatever scraping the fat out of the deep fryer. I don't know. Right. It was a pretty ugly scene. They had a set in the studio, the one, the gym that you guys did that piece on. Yeah. Um, and that set had been sitting there for eight or nine months untouched. Wow. That's, oh man, this thing is really pissing me off. Sorry, guys. Um, yeah, it had been sitting there for like eight or nine months, so they were really desperate. So I, I what I imagine happened is Miss Gavage was like, can we get this guy up here he's shooting these commercials and like why don't we have somebody like that and yeah it was it was a, he wanted a professional director finally we're gonna pay yeah. somebody who knows what they're doing that was basically and he knew yeah. your work yeah yeah exactly and and also you probably know this but in all of the advices that hubbard wrote he wrote one on hiring pros it was actually not for tech films it was for public films He's like, there's pros out there that are maybe on the B side of their career and, and they'll love to do this work because they'll love the credits right, or whatever. So he had, there was some precedent set, some something in policy where Hubbard said, yeah, hire people. So, uh, and Miscavige wanted to centralize the whole marketing unit. So he dismantled the LA unit. Yeah. And you know what, that's a crime in Scientology to take apart a working installation. So yeah. he but completely- he that all the time. Yeah, it's just because he knows better than than, than that. He knows better than everybody. <laughs> yeah, but sometimes he's right, though. That's the really scary thing. Well, and that he's is. Like, he is right yeah, sometimes, but, but a lot of times. Yeah, sometimes he's, he's right. really, he yeah. just hits hit the nail right yeah. in the head. I mean, well, that's, We just hate to admit that he's right. Yeah. Oh, no, I'll, ad I'll admit it because I, I have no, nothing. I have, I have no dog in the fight that, uh, yeah. that will go out of my way to impugn anybody. Right. So I give Miss Gavich a lot of credit for being really a fucking tactical genius, or he couldn't have pulled off what he pulled off. Yep. I mean, yes, if he punches you in the face, it's only because you stood in the way of a grand plan, which is intended to save everybody on Earth. So come on, man. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's not like, right. I'm not punching you because I'm mean. <laughs> but anyway, I'm sorry, we got off the track. So no, I was going to say, do you remember when you came up to the base for the first yeah, time? Absolutely, I believe it was actual location. Yeah, I believe it was early 1990. Yeah, like maybe January, February. There was a little bit of a what do you call it? A little bit of foreplay in LA. A little bit of a, what do you call it? Romancing in uh -huh. LA with who? CSUMO Gold, Ted Horner. You remember Ted? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it, it's kind of a funny story. I'll tell it really quickly. A couple of years before I went up to gold, they sent some executives to Celebrity Center to do a briefing on gold. It was essentially a recruitment cycle. I didn't really see it as that. I thought, oh, these are these people who make these films. I've seen them on course. They're important films. They're really shitty films. And I would like to do something to help that because <laughs> I am fervently a Scientologist, right? Yeah. And I figure that they're just hampered by reasons that I could come up with as a rationale for why they were so bad. But I found out later there were deeper reasons that they were bad, uh, endemic problems. Yeah. So, But these execs came to Celebrity Center and did this little briefing. I don't know who they were. They were women, a couple of them, but they weren't there by the time I got there. I, they were busted by then. They came to CC and they did this little presentation on gold. And then after it, I went up and I introduced myself and I said, listen, here's my phone number. If you ever want me to come up and help you make a film, I would be happy to. I never heard from them. <laughs> so apparently you have to resist really hard. Yeah. Right. And, well, and, what you resist will persist. <laughs> yeah. So if you just walk up and say, hi, how are you doing? I'd love to come up and make some films. They're like, oh, that's okay. Yeah. I, I literally never heard from them. It just... So then a couple of years later, I heard from this marketing person. I did the Dianetics ads. And then that becomes this huge smashing success. 
then we all get pulled up to gold. It's like, you know, I meet with Ted Horner. We'd like you. I don't, I know none of the, I know none of the stuff. I don't know Mark Fisher. I don't know. Yeah. I don't remember you. I don't know Mark Fisher. I don't know. He's about to get the shit beat out of him in the garage. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know that the crew is like banished to the galley and the sets <laughs> and the, I'm meeting with Ted Horner and he's showing me all these set renderings and I'm looking at them and I'm thinking they're not great, whatever. But it's like, that's the best they can do. He's like, what do you think about shooting this film? And I'm like, fine, I'll do it. So I went through clearances because everybody has to do what they call clearances. Yeah. Uh, which is, it's clearances are weird because the, the, what we call the 2D history, this, you, have to, you have to provide your entire sexual history, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. and, yeah, you know, you know that, that was never a requirement until the GO got in control and they are the ones who put that in. Yeah, probably because they jerked off to it at night reading it. But uh, <laughs> they were just a bunch of perverts. Uh, <laughs> it's YouTube, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so that was, I, I did it with another guy who was also going up there who I'd worked with on the Dianetics ads. So he and I, we have a thing in Scientology called twinning. Sometimes you'll get a, it's like a study partner. This is your study partner. So this other guy was like my study partner and we would sit there together and write up our 2D history because it was easier to just be in a room with somebody, right? Uh, and it was kind of like, not a lot of pressure. It was like, you know, you, when you get this done, then we'll move forward. It wasn't like get it done today. So, but it was kind of funny because we'd sit there and go, oh man, you had to write down the time, the place, you know what happened, like what kind of sex it was, and time, place, the for, and and the actual event of what happened. And so, I remember him saying to me, um, "I can't remember." Oh, I'm just going to write down. She rang the doorbell. It was the wrong address. <laughs> so. <laughs> just so for the viewers to know who don't know about Scientology, 2D history is your sexual history. Yeah, I thought every, I said yeah, every exactly. sexual encounter you ever had in your yeah. Life. Right yeah, down. and you think you're doing this because they want to assess you for security reasons, right? Which there's a lot wrong with that, but you excuse it. And and most importantly, you think you're giving it to somebody who is going to secure it, right? Yeah, who's going like you're giving it to a trusted person who will maintain the confidence of it. Well, and, and I we can tell you, Mitch, that people talk, you know, the people who are on the clearance lines, they they could joke about it. They go, can you believe this person did this? Blah, 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 blah. There was no no confidentiality. And I, I found that out later. Yeah. And I was just appalled. I mean, when actors would come up to gold, a lot of whom were not Scientologists, mm -hmm. um, they would have to do clearances, a much lighter form than we would be put through. But I would hear the talent people talking about, oh, so-and-so, can you believe it? Oh, we can't have her. And they'd come to me. Now, they were supposed to say to me, if a person wasn't qualified to come up, right. they're not qualified. And that was the end of the conversation, right? But right. they'd come up and they'd say, no, she's a lesbian and she's been doing like sex acts on, on the internet. or So they just spill the person's stuff, right? Which yeah. Was, whatever it was, they would just say it. Like, and then that made me realize like, oh, oh, nothing you tell them is ever in confidence in any way. Right. It's, it's exactly just right. blackmail material. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, it's yeah, yeah, it p potentially can. So anyway, so I did clearances. I got driven up there, you know, had some meetings, did a tour. Uh, and I don't know how much detail you want. I mean, I could tell you, one interesting story that uh, when I was walking through gold and they were explaining to me everything, it's very much set up like the old studio system, but, and it reminded me of, uh, of the guy who started the studio system uh, producer in Hollywood in the twenties named Tom Ince in the teens. And he was supposedly murdered by William Randolph Hearst. And on his boat, uh, it, some mishap, he thought his, his Charlie Chaplin was stripping his lover. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that later. But anyway, the, the R William Randolph Hearst gave Ince's widow a huge cash 
present. Nobody knows why. And she used that money to build the, the Chateau Elysee, which is wow. where CC is today. So it has this kind of the history of that building. Although yeah, a lot manor. of people say, that, yeah. yeah, the manor. A lot, yeah. a lot, a, a lot of people uh, will think, you know, that that story is not true, that it was made up. But, you know, Peter Bogdanovich made a film about it called yeah. The Cat's Meow, and it's a well-known sort of urban legend in Hollywood that William Randolph Hearst killed Thomas Anne. So it's interesting because I was walking around and I had this strange deja vu that Thomas Ince, who invented the studio system, he invented the departments where you had all of a sudden you had sets and props and makeup and you know, all this stuff that, as we know, Hollywood, they're very rigidly organized that way at Gold. And I went, oh, Thomas Ince would be proud. And then I realized, oh, wait a minute, his wife built the manor. So it was just a weird, funny, coincidental story. But. Let, let me ask you, Mitch, what was your first impressions? Do you remember when you first started working on your first film of the, the Sea Org members that were working on oh, the yeah. film with you? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, I had to do some courses when I first went up that I, I'm still kind of mad about but because I've been working for 20 years and then all of a sudden they're like, everybody has to do these basic courses. You have to do a course called the City Basics course yeah. and you have to do, I should have put it next to me. I could hold up my copy of The Five C's of Cinematography. Yeah, yeah and I, I did all those too because I, like I of said, I still did. remember them. <laughs> yeah, of course you did. The Five C's of Cinematography is an incredible book. I had it. It was my first real technical text in film school. Yeah. Uh, if it's, it's an amazing book, and somebody bought the rights to it and republished it. I have a first edition copy, like ten feet away. I wish I had it. I like hold it up. But anyway, uh, so I had to do these courses. But at least I noticed in the courses that they did things a little differently. So at least it helped me to reg recognize that some of the names of things and procedures or the people I'd been working with will be working with would be different, right? But in the long run, what it enabled them to do was create an illusion for themselves that they taught me filmmaking, okay? Because yeah. I did their courses. Now, I could have driven up there, gotten out of my car, walked in the studio and shot that first film, got in my car and driven home. Yeah. But no, I had to stay there. I had to, I had to do those courses. And, you know, I really wanted to help. So, but the staff, they were, the crew was really, really nice to me. Everybody was, as they say, spit and polish. I don't know if you, it's kind of a Sea Org yeah. term. Everybody was, yes, sir. Everybody was Mr. Brisker. Of yeah. course, that all changed as time went on, but. Mitch, I was going to tell you, you know, that I put together those courses. Of course, they were based on L. Ron Hubbard advices and stuff like the PACs. And, and then also all those manuals, like we had to get copies of the five C's of cinematography and there were a lot right. of other books that they had that were out of print. And it's so totally we had to print. get them and buy it, them. It, it I hadn't ran been printed that since I ran it that went out of print in 1967. Yeah, I had to, I ran that project to get it all. And then there were a bunch of films that L. Ron Hubbard suggested that the Cine Crew watch. Yeah, we, 200. we got them and put them all on videotape. Uh, and, and so yeah. I did all that before you ever got there. No, I know. I, I saw all that. So I didn't know you did it. Yeah. It was my understanding that the, the, the Xerox copies of the five C's, I was told that the gold had contacted the publisher and gotten permission, but I don't know if that's true. I don't that, know. That's like illegal. They we were actually had books when I was there, but anyway, sorry, yeah. we had the actual books when I, was Oh there. yeah. Okay. Well, they're yeah. really valuable. I mean the yeah. last one I bought one, I have two of them. Unfortunately, I left one of gold. I have a, a first edition uh, with a dust jacket and a more information card inside. It's probably worth 500 bucks. Yeah. So wow. they're very rare, even yeah. though it's been reprinted in paperback and you can buy it. But yeah. even to this day, anybody wants to make a film, it's such a basic tomb. Uh, I heard that Steven Spielberg at one time was thinking of creating a computer program for students based on the five C's of cinematography. Yeah. So I don't know, just something I heard, but the crew were incredibly nice. They mm -hmm. were, you can imagine their relief to being let out of the kitchen yeah. <laughs> and being able to like go back to work. Right. Yeah. And they all wore color coded shirts, which was right. this Hubbard each thing. Department, each department. Oh, yeah. yeah. Each department was color coded. Yeah. Uh, so I there were some things. That, that. Yeah, yeah. And this, the script supervisor wore 
who was the person I became the friendliest with. She left and became very successful. Was that Olga? Media. No. Was that Olga or who was that? No, I don't want to get into names. These people. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, her people initials we were. That's okay. You would know her. Yeah. Her initials were PK. Oh yeah, I know. I know who that is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Really good friend yeah. of ours. I've, I've, I'm friends with her now. Anyway. Yeah, she flew out to see me uh, uh, a couple years ago. Say hi. Yeah. I, I was kind of in really bad shape, but whatever. Because uh, yeah. I had just left and I was really yeah. not. <laughs> it's a lot, you know. Yeah. Um, so anyway, she, and, uh, she, the script supervisor, would wear uh, a bright red, scarlet red, fire engine red shirt. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> Hubbard could find her easier, yeah. more easily. He could, and whatever. And when we went out on location, I was just embarrassed as hell because I'm like, oh my God, I'll hide my face because you're with this crew. And on the back of the bright red script supervisor's shirt, it says yeah. script. And on the back of the gray cameraman shirt, it says camera. And <laughs> on the back of the whatever yellow sound green yeah. sound shirt, it says sound it, Mitch, it was like it yeah. was like uh clay demo you know clay demos with the little yeah label. exactly they were everybody was labeled <laughs> but you know when lrh was directing the messengers we had to wear checkered like you know the checker flag oh, yeah. the black and white checker we oh yeah i remember that i read about shirts. that yeah 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 i saw pictures yeah. of that yeah that and the red scarf for? around our neck yeah it was so chic it was so kind of <laughs> 60s yeah. chic no, I remember that. It was, yeah, it was crazy. Um, yeah, so uh, you want to, okay, so. Yeah, you were Jackson, just saying about your first experience on the crew. Yeah, so yeah. that was a bit strange. Uh, there was a few strange things. Uh, there was a director at that time, Joe Kinnean. You probably remember Joe. Oh, yeah. Yep. I think Joe famously did the sweat, the bad sweater video that was mocked on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> I think that was the last thing he directed, but uh, so You're we had our song, the "We Stand Tall" song. Yeah, 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 yeah. I call it the. I bad was in that trip. video. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a mark of honor, Mark. It's like I a know. badge of honor. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> damn, I wish I was in it. <laughs> but uh, let me see. Joe had been their director. The first production meeting we had, the the divisional secretary at that time was Diana Hubbard. I think she just came in to be the divisional secretary because I was coming in. Yeah. And she was CMO staff and they kind of wanted a, you know, somebody at that level to be at the top of that division and, and to, to help make sure that I got a smooth start. Mm -hmm. Right. So we had this meeting and Diana introduced me to the crew because, you know, they were all prisoners in the kitchen before I met. Yeah. I, had, I didn't really know any of them. And she said that I would be working with Joe Kinnean to apprentice him. And I'm, I'm thinking uh, nobody ever, uh, and it's the first I ever heard of it. But it was uh, like, uh, it was a cover story. It was like, here, the real story was, this is Mitch Brisker. He's going to direct. And if he works out, we're going to shit can this guy. And, and you're going to see him <laughs> cleaning dumpsters, okay? Yeah. Just thought you should all know that. With the so toothbrush. They, yeah, they put on this show that I was apprenticing Joe Kinnean. So I think he was there standing next to me for one day until they saw the first day's rushes, then he was gone. Oh. He was gone. And then he was uh, assigned, uh, Miss Gavage created the post of uh, dumpster IC, right? And Joe became the dumpster IC and he scrubbed dumpsters. That was his job. Later, he became an arborist and did some wonderful work with the trees at Gold and he was, you know, forgiven by Miss Gavage and said, "Hey, you well, do good well, work." Just before he was the arborist, though, he was the D weeder in charge. Yeah, he. he yeah, I he, know that because I was assigned as his deputy D weeder <laughs> yeah, after oh, my right. first yeah. escape. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, but I, I think ultimately the point is, um, <laughs> the point is, is that I did not feel good about being part of this person's demise. Yeah. Like I was, this is very typical of Scientology, especially the series. Well, you get pulled into things. So you're a participant in things that there's aspects of that thing that you're not aware of that are cause bad outcomes for other people. Yeah. Like in my industry, as a member of the director's guild, you're not allowed to take a job directing unless you tell the current director that you've been approached to replace him. 
by law, it's mandated. Right. Like, no funny business. Like if some producer calls you up and says, we want you to come in and replace right. Joe, you have to contact Joe and say, I've been contacted to replace you. Right. So, But they don't have that ethical standard. The most ethical group in the world does not have that that ethical standard. Uh, that professional ethical standard. So it was whatever. I mean, one of the, the first, uh, you know, we did this film. I was used to, because I did commercials, I was used to working really fast, uh, which they loved because, you know, commercials are a very, usually a very compressed situation. And so what would happen is we'd set up a shot and then we do the shot until I was happy. Then I would jump up and I'd say, okay, guys, here's what we're going to do next. And everybody like freaked out. They froze. They didn't know what to do because that wasn't my job. That's the supervisor's job. She's supposed to stand up and announce the next shot. So that that was weird, you know. So anyway, we worked that out, and it, they were good. They were they were good. They didn't. There were a lot of things they didn't know. The, uh, Let me ask they, you, Mitch. Uh, sure. What was your first interactions with Miscavige, David Miscavige, at that time? Like, did he ever come down on the set when you were first there? Or, uh, I don't. Or, or, I don't actually remember. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, the first time I. Saw uh, okay, well, this was a silent interaction. Uh -huh. It wasn't, we didn't speak, but the, when I was taking those courses I told you about, yeah, the first night I arrived in the course room, I saw a very strange, and you know, this, you know, you know what the course room like is like a golden night. Yeah. It just, every, it reeks, okay? It's just like the smelliest place in the world because you've got, you know, no, whatever, uh, 50 sorry, people yeah, crammed in, everybody everybody's been doing physical shit. They just smell like sweat and, yeah. and 90, most of them smoke and it's coming off their clothes. And so it's yeah. just like, Oh God. And, um, so I'm sitting there in the course room, I'm cracking open this pack and I'm this, this whatever materials and I'm about to do this course. And all of a sudden Miscavige followed by, uh, Marty followed by, I don't remember the order followed by, um, you know, uh, what's his name? Oh, Mark Yeager, probably. Yeah, well, Mark and then, there. yeah, you know, the IGs back then. And then, Ray yeah. Ray. okay, so those Ray four Mid guys. Yeah, 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 the four writers of the apocalypse. Yeah, that's and, right. And, yeah, and they come walking through the course room. I hear, I'm going to turn sideways, okay? They walk through the course room and they all go, and then they move off. I don't know if I pulled that off, but they just sort of walk through and their heads snap in my direction and they snap back and they walk away. Because yeah. they were, uh, and I and I went, oh, wait a minute. There must have been something that happened prior to my arrival that would cause those four guys to walk through. It was like, he's here. We got him, and he's in the course room. So um, anyway, that was the first time I saw him. And then after that, I think he might have come up and introduced himself to me, uh, you know. Or I would pass him, and he'd say something like, one time. Well, that, that's him. what I was going to ask you, because... You know, during that, you know, I'm sure during all the time, I mean, he would watch rushes, right? After you guys would shoot. And oh, yeah, would, that's right. That, yeah, them, I, right? yeah, yeah, I, you're right about I forgot. I did forget about that. But in terms of interacting with him, I would see him. I often would see him right after rushes. We would talk about it. So, I yeah, I saw him a lot. Like, uh, and we became very friendly. Like, yeah, we I was going to say, but that was my next question. Was yeah. he nice to you or did he and, treat oh, you yeah. with yeah. respect? Or did he yeah, yell at yeah. you, or did he ever no. treat you like that at the beginning? He, I mean, as as things evolved and he became more and more unhinged, um, yeah. and, uh, you know, it changed. I mean, his assistant, Lou, who you guys know who I'm talking about, she was yeah. the only executive in all of uh, Scientology that ever yelled at me, and that was on the phone, but it was still painful. And that was just like... At SMP, that wasn't even at Gold. So, no, I was treated really well. I was, uh, you know, I got lots of very expensive gifts. I got, you know, I got. Flown. And that makes sense to me because Miscavige, since you were not a Sea Org member or Scientology, you yeah. were a Scientologist but not a Sea Org member. Right. I mean, you're, you're being paid happen. to come there. I mean, he he would treat you like uh, uh, somebody, like, a, you know, somebody else he met, you know, uh, yeah. like another professional right but yeah, if you no, were a Sea Org member he treated you like a dog you know what I mean? yeah no i was i was pampered except you know i had to the the demand it's a funny thing because the demand to interact with the church of Scientology is one of the biggest problems that it has the demand it puts on people to interact with it uh 
that's kind of the, I guess, the first red flag of any organization like that is how much do they demand your participation. Uh, so that demand, he gets to put that on a proxy. In other words, he gets to put that on gold. So then they're the ones that carry that water for him. So he could keep treating me really nice while gold can just frantically call me up anytime, night or day, especially if I'm home and say, you need to get in your car and get up here. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's not him doing it. So sure, he's great, but then he does have his proxy people, right? And, exactly. You know, yeah, That's his flying monkey. He's got his flying monkey. So if if you're in trouble, like he's going to send Marty down. I mean, especially with regards to me. And I wasn't I wasn't in trouble that much. I, I not until later. I mean, the first time I was walking up to Qual, you know, which is the qualifications division. Right where they, you know, if you needed to go and do what is called cramming, which means you needed to be restudy some materials. I once received a cram, which is an order to restudy something. It was a local order from Gold. And I was walking up to Qual and I walked by, I walked by Miscavige and he said, where are you going? And I said, oh, I'm going up to Qual. I have a, I have a cram. And he said, you, you have a cram? Like, <laughs> But he didn't do anything. But he thought that was the most ridiculous thing in the world. Like, why are they cramming you? So that was kind of our... But then eventually he would write cramps. I got a couple of cramps from him, mm -hmm. written from him. Okay. Hey, uh, now, during that time period, of course, this is 1990. Do you remember the flood in August 1990? Well, I've moved forward a little from that. But yes, I remember the flood. Because that's when I, we blew. That's when Janice I know, and I left. I know. I remember it well because <laughs> I got to... It was a snow day for me. Uh -huh. Oh, right? I, for me, it was like, great. I could just stay home and, you know, fuck now, off. Now, were you staying in the G units? Because they were, they were yeah, renovating. Yeah, I was. I was. I, I yeah. was. When I first went up there, I was living in an apartment in town. Yeah. You know, uh, probably one of the apartments you guys lived in. I mean, I had yeah. one of myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I was making that drive. And it was really, like, geez, I'm driving from L.A. to Gold. And then I'm driving from Gold to some apartment. It's just too much. So, you know, they were, we're building you a cottage over here. And as soon as it's done, you can stay in it. And I was just so looking forward to that because it would be like less driving, more sleep, et cetera. And um, then the flood hit and I was living in them for a while. So I was so like, you, I'd stop. Yeah. So you were actually living there when the flood happened? Yeah, but I, w I was in LA. When oh, it but, but you would, okay. you were living there, right? I mean, well, no, I mean, I lived there. there. You just weren't there when the flood happened, right? Uh, no, I lived there Monday through Friday. I think the yeah. flood happened on a weekend, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then I live. I lived there. I stayed there Monday through Friday, and then I went home generally on weekends. And the flood happened on a weekend, and I got a call like, no reason to come up. Well, you would have uh, missed Janice. You would have missed Janice at that point because that was adios for her. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I yeah. Left. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I wish I would have known. Um, that I think if I, I would have known about your episode in the garage, I might have had second yeah. thoughts about saying that. But Let me you know, you when you're in, you're in. I mean, it's just like yeah. a reality distortion field. Yeah, um, we, we have we have a lot we can talk about, but I, I want to ask you a couple. Yeah, of questions. let's move forward. We're, just, we're jumping around a little bit, but sure, still, no okay. problem. Now you mentioned Marty, and he was you called him a flying monkey, and, and one of the one of Miss well, I'm monkeys. sorry, say that again. Uh, uh, Marty Rathbun, right? You yeah. called him like one of Miscavige's flying monkeys, right? He was like a henchman. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, you mentioned something to us when we were talking to you earlier. Like, he later, you know, left and came out, and he he was a major critic. A lot of our viewers right. know him because he came out, and he was part of uh, lots right. of televisions and movies and stuff like that. And then he came back. And um, you, were you at all involved with uh, the videos that he did uh, that no. Scientology put no. out? No. No, the videos of him, the interviews with him? Yeah, exactly. No, I was absolutely not involved with any of those. Okay. I did, I did some initial planning, like camera planning uh -huh. and so forth, but then I had gone back to gold. Uh, I was sent back to gold for various different reasons that I didn't agree with. But they shot those when I was back working at Gold. But they were done. I mean, I was there. That happened when I was at Scientology Media Productions, and Ms. Gavage came in, and a couple of us were meeting about something, and he said, uh, "Hey, Marty's back," and that that sort of. And we were like, "What?" 
Uh, but of course, he was never back. He was just like, he was just willing to turn on all of his friends and be videos. Right, everyone that helped him when he left. Yeah, he just turned on them all. But yeah, yeah, it's yeah. I mean, that whole universe. There's something really bad about it, and so it's kind of like. Whatever, I'm not going to defend Marty. I, I, I'm just going to say I understand why he did what he did. Yeah. You know, like his wife had never been in Scientology and they were destroying her life and destroying his life. And I'll yeah. tell you, they did they did that, as far as I'm concerned. Miscavige did that to Marty so that Marty at one point would say, Uncle, give me the check. I'll shut up. And then they went one step farther because it was probably a lot of money and then said, okay, we don't want you to just shut up. We want you to do some videos. Right. right. And I think, that, I think that may have appealed to him because he was such a narcissist and he loved being on the spotlight. And oh, that, yeah. was kind of, that kind of gave him something important to do again. Like it kept him relevant because I think Marty cared more about being relevant than anything else. So first he's relevant as a Miscavige attack dog. Then he he's relevant as a as a Scientology critic, and then he's relevant as a critic of Scientology critics. And now he's rich and he's gone. So that's kind yeah. of all. You don't old. hear from him anymore. No, I don't think you ever will. No. All right. And then another question, just because we're we, we're going to wrap this up here in a little bit. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of our viewers know Mark Headley, who's blown for good, and he worked yeah. in Cine with you and all that. Do you have any funny or amusing Mark <laughs> Headley story to tell? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, Mark was uh, he was a Mark was a fun guy to work with. He was my shoe crew chief for uh -huh. about two years, which means he ran the crew and made sure everybody showed up and then things were coordinated. He's Mark is a very, as you can probably tell, he's a very bright, uh, clever. Oh, yeah. uh, He's a yeah. really, he's a problem solver. Like he knows how to problem solve. And so um, one of the things that would have is there, there was a lot of organizational screw ups, like a shoot would be organized and we'd show up and find out there was no permit. And so then that fall problem would fall on Mark. So Mark got a lot of these kind of problems dumped on him. It was a bit of a hot seat job being the shoe crew chief. You had to be oh, very yeah. alert. So yeah. there was this, because the people that were setting that stuff up, they never had to leave the base. So if you went somewhere and found out there was no food, they were going to miss lunch that day. So we went to shoot at a construction site. It was arranged with the owners of the site. We needed a set. It would have been very expensive for us to actually build a construction site on a location. So right. they found an actual construction site. And there was, you know, there was a foundation and framing, and that's what we needed. Right, because we needed a scene where these people were framing, and uh, we and it was all legit. We got there, we had a permit, we had permission, and but the I guess the construction foreman when he left, he forgot to he the gate was locked. There was a heavy chain and a padlock around it, and it was like we're screwed. And Mark Henley walks up and he pulls out his wallet, and in his wallet he has a lock pick set. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm thinking, who the fuck here is a lockpick? I don't want to know. Mark, I don't want to know why you have a lockpick set. I'm just glad that you do. And he kind of looks over his shoulder and fiddle, fiddle, fiddle. Boom, the lock is open and we're shooting. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it was wow. like, Make it go right, right? Yeah, Make he's a handy guy. Right. Mark's a handy guy to have around. So there was, oh, wow. also, there was also like, you know, one of these trailers that they have at a construction site, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and that was locked too. We didn't have permission to use the trailer, but we didn't not, not, they didn't say we couldn't. So, you know, naturally Mark walked over there and picked the lock, you know, the door lock, like opened that and we had, we had a place to sit down and spread out our work. So anyway, that's. Interesting that's ability. <laughs> yeah. He had a lot of those and he was, he was, uh, I think he told the story. I listened to it uh, when we got in trouble shooting a, a sand dunes in, in Imperial County uh, because the two sides, uh, the road, that road intersects these imperial sound dunes. One side is you can't do any, you can walk, that's it. Yeah. It's completely protected by the Bureau of Land Management. The other side, you can shoot. It's where they shot uh, whatever, uh, Stargate, you know, all kinds of desert scenes. Mm -hmm. uh, looks like that desert scenes in Star Wars. Anyway, we, in order to get our shot, we had to shoot in a, part of the land that was forbidden for shoot crews for shooting 
we did. And the a, a Bureau of Land Management guy showed up. You know, they're like cops. They got guns. They got patrol cars. Right. And they wanted to know who was in charge. And they grabbed Mark. He didn't tell this part, I think just because he forgot it. But they had him in the patrol car for at least a half hour. And he just kept them busy while we finished shooting. So anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he has a lot. Of, he had a lot of nerve during that, and then we yeah, were down. Yeah, he's a good he, guy. He has a lot of nerve naturally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he has a lot of nerve. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah it's, like, Mark, he, he's. I've spoken with him. He's Mark's yeah. a good guy. And then Janice, you want to ask him about? Yeah, other yeah. I have another question. I've heard sure. that, like, we know that Shelley disappeared in two thousand. Shelley Miscavige. Yeah. She disappeared in 2006, I believe it was, when Leah asked the question as to where Shelley right. at Tom right. Cruise's wedding. And yeah. I had heard that you had run into Shelley after that. Yeah, I did. I ran into her a few years after that. It wasn't a long time after that. Let me just say that in that situation, a lot of people would disappear for a few years and I, I, or, or they would no longer be in your view because they'd be off on a mission or doing something crazy. So it wasn't odd right. at all that I didn't see her. And plus we all had sort of different schedules and whatever. So, but it was uh, probably between 2008 and 2000, sometime in that time frame. she'd been gone at least a few years. And I ran into her in Redlands and, uh, which is a small- Redlands, California, right? Yeah, it's a really nice, it's the, it's the last, uh, the place has an interesting history if you want to look it up, but it's, it, it, it's a money town. There's money there. There's great shopping and there's some fabulous restaurants. And then after that, you're into, uh, you know, it's like you're on the road to perdition. I mean, it's just nothing until you get to Palm Springs. Right. Mm -hmm. And right. Uh, so that's kind of the last, so where Shelly was rumored to be at the CSD compound, Redlands would be an obvious place to go and have a nice lunch or do some right. shopping, whatever. And, yeah. and she was she was there with three staff, two RTC staff and a CST staff member, who I I know them all, and and I look I saw them and I was like oh wow I haven't seen Shelly in a while I wasn't really thinking with it, but they looked like any four girlfriends out having a you know a friendly lunch and did you say hello or, or did oh you yeah I went over and said hi and it was there was yeah. like it was really out of context for all of us because we don't really run into each other outside of the Scientology anytime you'd run into them outside of a Scientology context would be just a, a little bit odd right so it was yeah. in a friendly way what are you doing hey what are you doing here I'm like oh I'm just on my way up to go oh okay we chatted for a minute nothing very superficial and that was that so and then you know I mean, for me, that just confirms that she's probably at that CST compound. But I mean, I have my own opinion on that. It's like yeah. I, I did a lot of projects for CST. And I've never been to that compound, but I've certainly seen a lot of pictures of it. And as far as I know, it was built to a level where if there was, you know, a nuclear biological disaster in L.A., that Miscavige and Tom Cruise and whoever, they could seek refuge there. It's, yeah, I've she's been not, there. Uh, I've been there. Yeah, yeah, yeah know, so you was, yeah. you know it's really nice. You can confirm that, right? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah so no, Shelley, there's underground vaults. There's beautiful cabins that were built, and and all sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's top and, of the line. Yeah, it's top of the line. And so you know, the hashtag where Shelley, you kind of think she's you know people think like she ain't chained to a bed in some mountain compound, right? She was a messenger when she was twelve. There is nothing outside of Scientology. L. Ron Hubbard's coming back. And Miscavige ain't going to divorce her because as long as they're married, she can't, if she wanted to, for some reason, she can't, you know, uh, you know, uh, testify against him. That's so, what I say. Yeah. So and that's the she, same thing, Mitch. That was our viewpoint when we left in 1992. Well, we'll just leave. And then when Hubbard comes back, we'll, we'll come back in the Sea Org. You know what I mean? Exactly. But slowly but exactly. surely we peeled the onion and then we went like, yeah, yeah, no, this is not happening. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, so that's the mindset. I mean, I, in a way, I think she's relieved to be out of that whole, the whole shit show, you know, I, I mean, I can't imagine the, what work she's doing because they don't really, there's no work there. They don't really, they just maintain the facility because all of, you know, the work is done in various different places and then the, the titanium boxes, right. Yeah. That contain all of the stuff. Those are packaged at gold. The only thing gold does is the film restoration aspect of it. 
they package them up and then they take them, somebody from CSD picks them up and then they right. stick them in the vault. So it, there's not really anything to do, I guess, except study and get auditing and maybe take hikes on the nice mountain trails. And, Mitch, I don't let know. Me ask you, let me ask you another question, okay, about sure. um, just so the viewers know, you were never a Sea Org member, right? You were you were a public person. Yeah, I was never on. And I you was never technology, right? Yeah, yeah, I was never on. Any right, so he, you you weren't a billionaire contract and all that stuff, no, right? No. Okay. So I, I, so how did you finally leave? Did you just quit? I wish I would have. No. Um, no. What happened was we were actually we were. <laughs> I it, quit. <laughs> yeah, it, it happened in layers. Okay, so in twenty eight. 20 no lockdown beginning of 2020 uh that's a whole nother story we can talk about some other time yeah. but yeah. i was i was with a i was on a location scout we were in a van we'd driven to san diego we used to shoot a lot in san diego we were looking at a beach in san diego uh and we got word that you know the pandemic had broken out and it was when it was escalating like oh the nba just shut down oh the nfl just shut down oh yeah. You know, and it was happening in layers and layers and layers. And then all of a sudden, somebody looked at their phone. Yeah, this van is just like got 10 people in it, right? It's probably a 15-passenger van because whenever there was a location scout, which only required me and two other people, but like 10 of the crew would pile into the van because they just wanted to get the fuck out of there. You know, you could always get, at least you go to Starbucks if you're on location, right? <laughs> right. So you know what I'm talking about. So I always, yeah. uh, whatever. So we're in this van and then, you know, all of their phones, you know, go off and they're all looking at the ones who had phones are looking at their phones and they're like, okay, so so-and-so, uh, we're going to drive Mitch home and then we're going to go back to the base. Right? So they drove me to LA. They went back to the base. And then I got a call from the, the divisional secretary. And she said, look, if you want to continue working here, you have to come up here and stay here and bubble with us until the pandemic's over. And no. I'm like, I, I've been trying to get out of this place for, you know, over two decades. I'm not going to go fucking live up there for a year. I mean, it, it was already, I used to get, um, I used to call it uh, color, color deprivation. I don't know if there is even such a thing. It happened to me a couple of times, but just being constantly with people in uniform and like it, it limits the characteristics and the colors of the people that you interact with. And, it actually has a sort of numbing effect on you. So like I could, you know, the, it, the, the sort of sameness, right. And you're, everybody has, is wearing, you know, costumes and they all have the, cause they're not uniforms, they're costumes and they all have the same schedule and blah, 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 blah. Right. it would drive me fucking nuts. And the idea of doing that for two years, I mean, I'd rather shove a knitting needle into my, I'd rather, gouge my eyeballs out with, with grapefruit spoons that spend a year, however long doing that. So I said, no, that's fine. I'll go home. And so, they, you know, I would, uh, you know, they'd send me writing projects and, and that's, that sort of petered out over time. And then by 2021 ish, I was saying, look, I'm, I'm, I can't do it. You know, they kept offering me work. Uh, and I couldn't do it. Cause I was just like, I started making excuses you know, they offered uh, to to uh, charter a jet and fly me to Clearwater so that I could work on the planning for the LRH exhibit at the new, that they're intending for the new auditorium, the LRH Hall thing. And I'm like, I don't feel comfortable. It's the pandemic. So as, as, at a certain time, they sort of got got the idea, right? And then I kind of, there was a period where I was really not doing well mentally and physically. And they came to my house to check up on me and I sort of took their help. I, I, I didn't do any more Scientology, but you know, I, it was one of those quote unquote seven times that it takes you to get away from your abuser. Right. You get what right. I'm saying? So then yes. I had further interaction with them and then around uh, 2020, what well, was 2022 winter, 2022. I said, that's it. I'm fucking done. I just, I, I don't want any interaction with them anymore. I want to say hi to some of my old friends and I call right. Jeff and I call, I talk to Mike and you know, it happens in layers. So, yeah. And then I had, I had people reaching out to me like Jackson reached out to me. He got my number from somebody and he said, I just wanted to thank you. You never knew this, but when you first came up there, you made life really easy for the crew for a while. You were a huge relief to them because 
Miscavige was on his best behavior when you were around. And so it just, and plus you guys were getting work done and, you know, people were getting, you know, so a little bit of time off and some bonuses and, and things were great. I mean, eventually that all spirals out of control because that's just the outcome of Scientology. It just does not have an, ever have a good outcome. But right. that, that was, you know, I mean, when Jackson called me and then I had another kid call me, uh, that's a whole nother story, but who he saw me getting a sec check. He, he knew it because I was hanging outside of HCO having a cigarette with a sec checker back when I smoked many years ago. And uh, he was being marched by in some drills, right? Uh, by a very stern sewer old guard dude and they were in a bunch of trouble it was during one of these episodes where they were made to sleep in tents out on the on the lawn you know with yeah, the oh, going yeah. It's covered yeah, yeah, it's, about that. yeah so i was get, getting a sex check during the time they were marching by information and this kid who i really adored and i took him on my wing and really helped him a lot as a filmmaker in his particular technical area and he saw me and uh he thought to himself that if he, if I'm not safe there, nobody's safe, right? If I'm not outside of that happening. And it, at a later point, he got in a lot of trouble and hopped the fence for nothing he did. I mean, what he got in trouble for, he later in, in the film industry was rewarded for. So it was that crazy. Wow. I, I don't want to go into detail because yeah. it's his story, but he called me up practically in tears. Uh, we finally spoke. And he was just like, I don't think I would have had the confidence to leave and have a career if I hadn't worked with you. So I was like, wow, I did something. You know, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm yeah. whatever. I'm in my 70s and I'm running out of money and things are in many ways are not good. But I, you know, those things are something that I really cherish that I like because that was sort of part of me that they could never kill. Right. Uh, yeah, it feels good to influence someone on the good. Well, especially you never knew what happened to them. They left and then you find yes. out, you know, 20, 20 years later that they had become fabulously successful and never stopped thinking about you. And, you know, it was it was quite touching. So, right. That's, oh, great. that's great. So, yeah, there, there's goodness. There's there's just there, there is something about we did have authentic human experiences that were meaningful and led to something in spite of all of the horrific chaos and abuse and right and, right. and so forth. So, right. I mean, I, one of the reasons I was, I have to say, Mark, before we go, one yeah. of the reasons I was reluctant to speak out is because there are some people in that organization and especially at Gold who, for one, helped me when I was in a crisis, which we all have from time to time, didn't yeah. punish me, didn't judge me, but helped me uh, to the degree that they could. And I care about those people. And I, uh, but because remaining silent never hurts the victim. I thought, well, if you really care about those people, you should tell your story because maybe in some way it'll help them. So, yeah, and whatever. it does. It, it does. does. It's the same way with family. You know, people that are still in. My ex-wife is still in there. Yeah. You know I mean? and, right. and it's, you know, it's the same thing. She wouldn't leave with me. And you got to do what you got to do. You know, it's. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But anyway, the um, it, started this, I, I get emails from people thanking me because yeah. it meant so much to them just hearing the different stories. It's change yeah. it's shifting things in their universe. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, listen, Mitch, we're gonna um we're good. It's we're just over an hour. We're gonna end the video here, but we'd love to have you back and interview you some more if that's all right with you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, no, no problem. I'd be happy to do it and I appreciate your Okay. Allowing me to come yeah. into your community and speak. And I intend to be doing a lot more of it. And uh, no I have problem. a book that's going to be coming out soon. So Oh, that's right. Yeah, you have yes. a book that you've written, and right? I've, I've I started reading it and it's very good. People will well, love thank it. You. Thank you. It's, yeah, it's a different angle. It's a different text. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a it's not a tell all tattle tell joke uh, book. It's kind of on a higher thought level, but... Yeah. We'll but it's, it it's good that you tell your experiences again for others. And also it's, I find it cathartic too, just even doing these videos, you know? Um, yeah. 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 Anyway, Mitch, I'm, I'm going to take you out of the stream for, would you just hold on for a minute? I'm just, we're just sure. No problem. And See we'll you later, everybody. Video. We're going to talk some more. So hold on. All right. Okay, great. Sure. Thanks, Mitch. Anyway, that's uh, Mitch Brisker, everybody. And we want to thank you all for watching. First of all, we want to say, please subscribe to our channel. Uh, we have great shows like this, interviews, and we hope you enjoy them. Uh, hit that subscribe button. As Janice says, slam that subscribe button. 
uh, hit the like it. button for us. Smash, not slam. <laughs> smash that subscribe button for us and hit the likes. Um, also, if you have any questions, please ask them in the comment section. Uh, we read all the comments and we will answer them. And then, like we said, we will have Mitch on again. And if you've got questions for him, please go ahead and ask. And then we'll save them and we'll ask him when we come back on the next time we do an interview with him. Okay. Yeah, they can email the questions to me at Janice Gillum Grady at gmail.com. Just any questions you have for Mitch, email them to me and we'll bring them up in our next interview with him. Okay, great. Janice, have you got anything else you wanted to say before we end off here? Have, have a good uh, week and uh, thanks for being with us. We, yeah, thanks, we everybody. appreciate your support. Thank we'll you. See you later. Bye-bye.